Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. We are now at the fourth episode of a series of five on the technologies developed by the Bamboo Project. Uh, the Bamboo Project, I remind you, is a project funded by the European Union, whose aim is, uh, uh, in short, to make heavy industry more sustainable through the new technologies that uh, we are exploring in this webinar series. Today, our panelists, uh, who I'm going to introduce, are going to talk about uh, high temperature temperature, heat pumps, and steam generation. First of all, a couple of uh, rules. Uh, please uh, keep your microphones and cameras uh, switched off so that we can focus on the speakers and the slides. You can ask questions uh, to the panelists uh, just by writing them down in the chat box, uh, which uh, you should see on the right side of your screen. And you can do so while our panelists are speaking. Actually, we will send them to, to them. I also remind you that this webinar is being recorded, so it will be possible to access, to access it in the future. You will uh, receive a link to, uh, to, to the video, uh, and it will also be accessible on, uh, uh, on YouTube. So this is what is going to happen in the next hour and a half. If you have attended one or more of our previous webinars, you know we propose a post to the audience in order to know you better and make you participate actively in the event. Uh, this time it will be uh, slightly different than in the past. So after this introduction, there will be a first round of polls. Uh, then Jorge Arroyo and Álvaro Pacharroman from Fundación Circe will present the Bamboo project. Uh, its objectives, uh, the technologies it is developing. Uh, we will then go through another session of uh, polls, after which uh, Felix Hubman uh, from the Austrian Institute of Technology, Clément Gachot from EDF, the uh, French electricity company, and uh, uh, Lucas Zeilerbauer from the Energy Institute at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz will illustrate the topic of this webinar, which focuses on highlighting the fundamentals of uh, high temperature uh, heat pumps. Uh, but this time we will have uh, uh, also another uh, quest, another session of polls toward the end of the last uh, presentation, so be ready. <laughs> and uh, we will close the webinar with uh, questions from the audience. So as I said before, delving into the topic of this webinar, we are going to ask you a few questions to learn a little bit about you. So here is the first poll. What do you expect from this webinar? Uh, do you expect to learn about uh, standards or regulations, about uh, efficient technologies for your company, uh, about projects of similar companies, or are you here uh, mainly to network with the companies and share similarities and solutions? Now a couple, uh, a few seconds to let you answer, and then we'll see the the results. Okay, so most of you are here to learn about efficient technologies for your company. Uh, Twenty-four uh, percent uh, want to learn about projects of similar companies, and only six percent are here to learn about standards and regulation or to network with the companies and share similarities and solutions. Second poll. We are asking you to select your area of work in which industry you are working, paper, steel and iron, mineral, petrochemical or some other industry. So we can see uh, where the re where the interest in interest uh, goes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's quite funny. Most of you are from some other uh, uh, industry, so it's funny because uh, the technologies that are developed by the Bamboo Project are aimed mainly to the other, to the, the paper industry, steel and iron, mineral and petrochemical. 9% uh, are from the petrochemical industry and nobody from the mineral industry. Last question, last poll. Which is your role? 
Are you in uh, R&D? Are you a technician? Are you in maintenance? Are you a manager? Or are you something else? Okay, so uh, most of you, 31% are from R&D. Um, 29% are managers, and so uh, I think you will also appreciate the uh, market-based part of this webinar. Uh, then you, we have 12% of technicians, uh, uh, just 1% of maintenance, and 27% are from other uh, sectors, other, uh, are, are in other roles. Okay, so thank you everybody for your participation. Now we'll give the floor to the first panelists, Jorge Arroyo and Alvaro Pecharroman from Fundación Circe, who will tell us more about the Bamboo Project. Uh, I ask the other panelists to keep their cameras and microphones off, so please uh, Jorge and Alvaro tell us about this project. Thank you, Selena, for your introduction. Well, Bamboo Project is a project funding, as, as Selena previously said, funding by the European Commission. The, the name of the project is Boosting New Approach for Feasibility Management by Optimizing Process of Gas and Waste Use. This is part of the 8th 2020 and is for the car of SPI. This is an innovation and action funding by the European Commission with almost uh, more than 11 million. We have a duration of 54 months that will finish on February of 2023. And this project is coordinated by CIRSE and we have 19 partners. That uh, I, the partner involved, there are some universities, some, some private industry, and these are uh, collaborating with the two uh, uh, objective for the age 2030, that is nine, seven and nine. So now I will leave you with uh, Jorge, who is going to take care of the technical part of the project. Thank you, Alvaro, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being connecting today. As most of you know, the, the energy transition towards a competitive and decarbonized energy system is a challenge for the intensive industries of the European Union. So in this context, in Bamboo, we are developing new technologies which will help to reduce the energy cost between a 15 to 20 percent, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions until the 23 percent, and improve the energy efficiency between a 17 to 20 percent. So in this sense, Bamboo project is aimed at demonstrating innovative technologies that can contribute to the European industry decarbonization, including which we are the three innovation pillars of the project. Uh, waste heat recovery, electrical flexibility, and waste stream valorization. We are working on the demonstration of these technologies in four at an industrial level in four demonstrators from the steel, petrochemical, mineral, and the pulp and piper sector. In bamboo, we demonstrate technologies for waste heat recovery. Uh, this is to valorize the energy content of some waste streams, which have some energy value due to their temperature. Uh, the project aims at demonstrating two technologies, uh, high temperature heat pumps, and organic ranking cycles. In the case of high temperature heat pumps, uh, which is the main topic for today's webinar, so we will see in deep in the in the main part of the webinar. We are uh, developing heat pumps to upgrade the low to medium grade waste heat to higher temperatures in the steel sector to produce steam, which can be reintroduced in the process. Uh, this steam. Uh, had, uh, has a direct impact in the gas natural consumption since part of the, it contributes to the reduction of the steam generated in, in natural gas boilers. The second technology contributes to the electric consumption reduction 
in, in the uh, two-part refinery by the valorization of medium grade waste heat uh, coming from from a crude distillation unit and is used to produce electricity which helps to reduce the consumption of the plant from the from the grid and the second pillar which is the electrical flexibility includes technologies and operational strategies that could make possible that industries take advantage of the low electricity prices and even provide service to the grid and it also enables the potential of the integration of renewable energies bamboo is working in applying this concept in the pulp and paper sector in the european company a german company where different strategies and technologies are implemented to allow the operation of the paper plant as a battery in the regional grid. The concept uh, in this case is that during summer, where there is a high uh, renewable energy generation, especially photovoltaics, is expected the plant will reduce uh, or some of their own gener electricity generation system, while in winter mode, where there are low uh, photovoltaic energy generation uh, the systems of upms cannot only provide uh, electricity for internal use but also supply energy to the local power grid uh, finally the third pillar is this waste stream valorizations which includes technologies and processes to upgrade and valorize the waste streams which have some calorific value and uh, produce internal or external in the processes and they can be valorized as fuels in other processes uh, here bamboo aims at demonstrating different technologies in the steel sector and the mineral sector the concept for the steel sector is the valorization of process gas uh, produced um, in the steel production different stages and replace the natural gas in the furnaces with this of process gas and here in bamboo we are applying two technologies simulation and uh oh, sorry and a flame monitoring sensing which helps to control the combustion of these uh, low calorific value gases for the mineral se sector uh, the case studied is this by simulations of the replacement of biomass in a multi-fuel log and ox burner developed during the project. In this burner, part of the fossil fuel is replaced by the biomass, uh, contributing to the direct reduction of uh, fossil fuel consumption and uh, CO2 emissions. In this slide, uh, gathers the expected indirect impact in, of the different solutions of the bamboo project if they were applied to the 1% of the industries of the European Union of each sector. As you can see, for the steel and iron sector, there is an important reduction in the electrical consumption and the fuel cost in the energy costs of the company. And if the, in the in the greenhouse emissions of this sector. The rest of the sectors you can see here at lower, lower values, but also very important in a global context. Uh, finally, I want to remind that this is November is the bamboo, bamboo industry month. Uh, we are covering out uh, different webinars for the different technologies. If you couldn't attend the first three webinars, you can find them on the uh, YouTube page of the project. You can also uh, find the, the presentations in the, in the web page of the Bamboo project. And I encourage you to, to register on the last, on the next week um, webinar which will be dedicated to the virtual battery model I have previously explained. So thank you everybody for attending today. I hope you, you find this webinar of interest.
Thanks a lot, Jorge and Alvaro. Uh, I have a question for you. So uh, the, the Bamboo project uh, we heard is funded by the European Commission. Uh, do you think it could, could have been possible without uh, the existence of the European Union? Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, because uh, thanks to the funding received of the uh, by the European Commission uh, allows the to to form a strong consortium of uh, technological centers, uh, big companies, and small and medium companies. So we in this kind of projects or the from the programs uh, H2020 and Horizon Europe, we can have a good funding for innovation and this is a good way to, to form um, international consortiums. So the solutions uh, develop, uh, I, I think that they are hard to obtain without such support. Great. Uh, so um, now, uh, before getting into the topic of today's webinar, we will have another round of polls uh, to understand uh, <clears throat> the relationship that uh, you, our audience, have with the technology that uh, we are going to talk about today. So if we can have uh, the first poll, here it is. Do you know of any industrial heat pumps on the market that can reach temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius? Okay, so 60% of you uh, have heard of uh, industrial heat pumps with these uh, characteristics and 40% haven't. Second poll, uh, how do you think that uh, heat pumps can produce more valuable in heat than electrical energy invested? Uh, do you think they break the laws of therm thermodynamics? Do you think it's just not possible or do they transfer thermal energy from a colder temperature level? Okay, all of you have answered the, the I have given the third uh, option as an answer. Uh, we will see if you're right uh, in uh, in our presentations. Um, so uh, um, let's hear now how steam generating heat pumps can help lower energy costs in industrial processes thanks to greater energy efficiency. Uh, before I remind you that you can write your questions in the chat box. Uh, the first uh, uh, the first panelist uh, is uh, Felix Hubmann, research engineer at the Austrian Institute of Technology. Felix, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from my side too. Um, I'm very glad to see that, that many people are interested in industrial heat pumps and steam generation. Um, this uh, talk is mainly focused on the capabilities and challenges that you that heat pumps in industrial processes have. And before I start, I want to reintroduce myself and my project partners and also the companies we work for. So I myself, I'm Felix Hubmann. I'm working for, as a research engineer at the Austrian Institute of Technology in Vienna. And the Austrian Institute of Technology covers a broad spectrum of research fields in the applied sciences. However, I'm mainly concerned with the concern with the decarbonization of the industry. And this is a huge task and it can be met with for example, heat pumps, which is the topic of today's talk. Um, next, my project partner, Clement Bachot, will take over. And he's, a re he's in the research and development division of the EDF group, and he's managing a project dedicated to develop and spread low carbon heating and cooling solutions for industries. For those of you who don't know EDF yet, it's a French electricity supplier, and it is known for being the first producer of low carbon electricity worldwide. Um, the final part will be presented by my project partner, Lukas Zeilerbauer. 
He's working at the Energie Institute at the JKU Linz. This is a non-profit research organization and it has a special focus on all things concerning the energy, energy transition with a strong focus on ecological and economic process assessment. Um, so on to my part, so I will... So I will start with a little motivation. Uh, Jorge already showed you how much emissions could be saved with the technologies developed in the Bamboo project, um, but I want to take a more holistic view and uh, focus on the emissions worldwide and then show you how waste heat can be used to upgrade process heat to a higher, higher temperature level in the second section of my talk, which are the, the basics of industrial heat pumps. And my part will be finalized with a presentation of an industrial demonstrator that was actually built um, within a research project that the AIT was part of. Um, so let's start with a look at the energy demand of the industry in a global perspective. So in worldwide, the global energy demand of the industry sector is 29,000 terawatt hours. And this is an enormous number, and I don't want to focus too much on the size of that number, but I want to focus on that half of that invested energy goes to loss. So half of only half of the energy invested is actually used, and the second half is just lost in, for example, wasted in cooling water and fumes or as radiation friction or electrical resistance. Um, but still, I, I want to give you an idea how huge this number actually is. And to, for example, if that energy amount was um, provided by gas at the gas price of 100 megawatt hours, uh, at 100 euros per megawatt hours, as we have seen a lot lately in Europe, um, this would translate to 30 trillion dollars annually, or a third of the global GDP. And in another perspective of emissions, the industry sector is responsible for 30% of the global CO2 emissions. So these are, in my opinion, both pretty, pretty impressive numbers. And we can lower them by addressing these losses. And I want to show you how heat pumps valorize these, this waste heat and upgrade it to a higher temperature level. Um, but before, uh, let's have a look at um, some sectors that can be covered by the heat pumping technologies. And these are more or less uh, temperatures below 200 degrees Celsius. Um, as you can see in this figure, this makes up more than 30% of the total heat demand of the industry. And from the huge, huge numbers we've seen before, this is still a quite impressive cut. And in this talk, we will also present two demonstrators. And one of them is for steam generation of temperatures up to 150 degrees Celsius. And the other one is for industrial pro, uh, drying processes. And therefore, I want to present a share of, the, uh, of these two uh, energy intensive industries. And first, let's have a look at the paper and chemical industries. In these two industries, the demand for low pressure steam makes up 30% um, of the total heat demand. And <laughs> keeping the, the numbers before in mind, even after all these cuts, this is still a huge amount. And what's important to say that th this can be addressed with steam generating heat pumps uh, now or in the near future. Um, another pretty in energy intensive sector is industrial dry drying. Uh, so still, a, it, it makes a huge share of the total industrial energy demand. And what we can see in this uh, figure below is that uh, a lot of the heat input is just um, <clears throat> is just uh, disregarded to the environment. And this is where a heat pump comes into place. So they're perfectly suitable for valorizing this waste heat and upgrading it to a higher temperature level. And as I said, these, these two sectors were addressed by heat pumps in demonstrators and will be presented later. Um, 
but they are not only so heat pumps are not only important for these two sectors but also for the general um, energy intensive industries uh, in this graphic we can see that um, by projection of the IEA the International Energy Agency we, if we want to meet our climate goals we but by 2050 we have to um, decrease the demand of fossil fuel fuels which can be seen here um, from more than 50 percent to down to 10 percent and increase the demand for of heat pumps which uh, is, is barely visible here and will be around um, 30 percent in 2050. So what this means is that uh, for the next 30 years we need to install 500 megawatts of heat pumps per month and to translate this this uh, 100 125 medium scale heat pumps or 50 large scale heat pumps each month. And so up until now, you, you've heard a lot about the need for heat pumps, but now I want to illustrate how exactly we can use them. So and, uh, before I present, um, I want to start this off with a quote. So if there are clouds over the roof and fire in the basement, there can be a heat pump instead. And I think this exactly this is exactly what can be seen in this animation. So here we have again our heat demand and that's split up into the used heat and the waste heat. And as you can already as you might already imagine, we can use that waste heat and put it into a heat pump and upgrade it to a higher temperature level and use this process heat um, to feed the heat demand initially and by that lower the reliance on fossil fuels. Um, on the next slide I've brought a more specific example where we can see how um, a steam boiler might be replaced um, by a heat pump and this replacement can yield uh, a CO2, CO2 emissions reduction of 100%. So in the, if we have electric power that comes in at no CO2 emissions, then this whole process ha doesn't have any CO2 emissions anymore. And where, does, where, where do these CO2 emissions actually go? So in this figure, you can see that they, for the fossil fuel, driven steam boiler, they more or less go out of the chimney. And when we use the heat pump, we valorize that waste heat again and reintroduce it to the cycle and upgrade it to a higher temperature level. Um, you might have seen the number in the middle written here, which is the COP, the coefficient of power. Um, this is a very representative uh, number for heat pumps. And I will explain what this number means on the next slide. Um, but first, uh, let, let me um, explain how a heat pump works in principle. So here you can see a typical heat pump process. Um, and it works at <clears throat> with, with a refrigerant working at two temperature levels. And at these temperature levels, there occur phase changes. Um, so starting at the evaporator, we Come, come in with uh, waste heat that it's that's at a higher temperature at as uh, it has a higher temperature than the refrigerant at this point and transfers heat over that heat exchanger to the refrigerant. By that the refrigerant evaporates, which which can be seen in this uh, diagram on the right side. So along this line, the refrigerant evaporates and is then compressed along this line, which can be seen here by the compressor that needs electrical energy as an input. Um, since this is a diagram that plots the, the pressure over the enthalpy, we see that the pressure rises during the compression and with that pressure rise comes uh, a temperature rise. So at this point, the refrigerant is hotter than the process heat needed and transfers heat over heat exchanger to the process heat. And to conclude the circle here, we have to get back to the lower pressure level in order to um, in order to evaporate the medium again. And to get there, we use an expansion valve that lowers the pressure and at the same time, it also lowers the temperature. 
So this goes exactly to the question you've answered already, and I'm pretty impressed that everybody got it right. So heat pumps don't um, cheat the laws of thermal, thermal dynamics. They do transfer thermal energy from a colder temperature level to a higher temperature level. And this is in con contrast to a heat exchanger that can only transfer heat from a hotter to a colder temperature. And as we've seen now, the heat pump can actually transfer thermal energy from a cold bath to a hot bath by employing electrical energy. Um, to now going to our most important number of a heat pump, the COP, the coefficient of power. So it's uh, useful heat provided divided by electrical power invested. So the we can determine the amount of process heat, which is the useful heat provided and divided by the electrical power. Um, to give this more meaning, I want to go back to a statistic which um, shows the total waste heat uh, worldwide versus the total process heat, which is um, waste heat and heat needed for industrial processes. And if, for example, we take uh, waste heat at 60 degrees and upgrade it to 140 degrees by a heat pump, this would normally be achieved with a COP of around 2.4. Uh, this means that if we, if I need 2.4 megawatts of uh, process heat, um, I need to invest one megawatt of electrical power and and by that draw 1.4 megawatts out of the waste heat at 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, one thing that's to mention here is that the COP gets higher the closer these temperatures are to each other. So, for example, if we took um, 100, if we had 100 degrees of waste heat and 120 degrees of uh, process heat, we would see much higher COPs here. Um, but the presented heat pump cycle wouldn't work with a, without a refrigerant that undergoes that phase change in order to make the, this process possible. And therefore, I want to present an overview of refrigerants. And uh, sorry, Felix, before going on, we have a question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, regardless of industry for med grade waste heat, which route provides the most energy efficiency, uh, CO2 equal reduction, high temperature heat pumps, steam, ORC, or waste heat ch chillers? Um, I think it depends on the process you have. So, it, so if you already have an industrial process that needs process heat of uh, it makes more sense to install a heat pump, but if you don't need that process heat, an OSC that produces electricity directly might make more sense. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, I'll, I'll continue on now. Thank you, Felix. Um, yes. Sorry. Okay. Very nice. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so where was I? I think I wanted to talk about refrigerants and uh, for, for this to show what um, the differences in this, these refrigerants are, I brought here the temperature enthalpy diagram. And here you can see that the different refrigerants have um, different critical temperatures. So more or less the maximum temperature a heat pump employing this refrigerant can, re can reach. And the width of these curves is the latent heat. And you, you see that the presented refrigerants here have different characteristics, and it makes a lot, so it's very necessary to choose the right refrigerant for the right application. And these refrigerants, of course, also differ from the, in their environmental impact, um, but a closer discussion on this topic will be given by Lucas at the end of this talk. Um, I will now continue with uh, a presentation of the various configurations of heat pumps. So how a heat pump might actually look like and how it is implemented in industrial process processes. Um, we, have, so, we have another question, Felix, I'm okay. sorry. Yes, please. No, no worries. Is, is the COP only dependent on the temperature difference or does it depend also on the absolute lower temperature? Um, I think it's this is best seen when thinking about the Cano uh, the Cano COP of a heat pump. Um, it's basically 
um, the Kano efficient, the reciprocal uh, value of the Kano efficiency. And on top, you can you have the higher temperature level, which is divided by the temperature difference. And the higher the higher temperature level gets, the higher the COP gets, but also the higher the temperature difference gets. And to answer your question, that if the lower if the lower temperature level gets colder, then of course the temperature spread gets higher. And or also in, in heat pumping technologies, you would call this temperature lift gets higher, and this lowers the COP. Um, but it also gets lowered if you, for example, increase the higher temperature. And if, I think if I remember correctly, if you increase the higher temperature by the same amount as the as you decrease the, the cold temperature, the factor is about three. So it's worse if you decrease the lower temperature than increasing the higher temperature. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are actually receiving a few questions, so I think uh, we will uh, ask them at the end of your presentation, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, um, so in, in this heat pump um, scheme, we can see that, uh, again, we have our evaporator and our condenser. And these are also called heat source and heat sink, since at the heat source we take energy out of the waste heat and at, at the heat sink, we um, get energy and add it to, uh, we, we take energy out of the refrigerant and add it to the process heat. And in this case, we, you can see that we st start off at the lower temperature of, of at the waste heat and draw it from that industrial process and add it to the refrigerant, compress it by the compressor, and then <laughs> evapor uh, and condense it in the condenser and transfer heat to the uh, process heat fluid, which can then be used in an industrial process and afterwards it's fed back into the heat sink. And to close the cycle again, we need that expansion well to get back to the lower pr pressure level. Um, so th this talk is uh, called um, high temperature heat pumps and steam generation. So next we want to Highlight, highlight how steam generation with the heat pump might work. So here I brought an example where on top of that condenser, we implemented a um, flash tank. And in, to get steam out of the pressurized water that comes out of the condenser, we, we need a flash valve. And at that flash valve, some portion of the water is evaporated, and that portion can be drawn from the flash tank and you and fed into the industrial process as steam. And this system is also employed by the heat pump presented by Clément later in this webinar. Um, next, I want to present to you the heat pump configuration, configuration where you, where heat is uh, where steam is produced directly in the condenser. And this is the advantage of just um, saving the extra part of a flash tank. And to a little upgrade to this system is to recompress the steam produced at this stage. So what we're doing here, we, we get steam at the temperature, let's say maybe 150 degrees Celsius. And then we recompress it with a vapor compressor. And this is this uh, system is called mechanical vapor recompression, also known as MVR, and upgraded to a higher temperature level. And the key uh, benefit of this technology is that you can reach temperatures uh, way above 200 degrees Celsius, where heat pumps right now are having a hard time reaching them. So if you use steam in your industrial process, um, this configuration makes a lot, lot of sense since it allows you to reach very high temperatures. Okay, so I've presented you what what steam. Uh, I've gave you a little. I gave you a little overview what steam uh, what heat pumps are capable of, um, but there are also challenges when um, implementing implementing a heat pump in an industrial process. 
Um, so first of all, heat pumps um, get less efficient if they are if they are very high temperatures and high lifts. So this goes in the direction of the question asked before. Um, if the the heat demand of the heat pump of the process heat must be met by the waste heat supplied, so this has to meet um, three criteria. So this is first of all the amount. So the the waste heat has to have the right amount to supply energy for the process heat. Then waste heat and process heat need to be there at the same time. And if they are too far away from each other, you might have to install really long pipes or lose a lot of heat along the way, and your system might become um, inefficient or unaffordable. So the next um, challenge is the quality of the waste heat. So th this is temperature and uh, fluid quality. So if the water you feed into your heat pump is dirty or not. And the, the last challenge is economy. So an heat, a heat pump m makes more sense when they are installed in a new plant. So it's uh, harder to replace the gas burner in an industrial process and make sense financially at the same time, but still there, there are many cases where this is um, also possible. Um, low electricity to gas price ratio also helps uh, heat pumps in, to make them feasible. Um, you, using the heat pump very often makes it also <clears throat> um, very favor, favorable since um, it has higher investment costs than, uh, for example, a gas burner or an electric, electrical resistance heating. And if you use it often, then these um, efficiency advantage really comes into play. And a heat pump is especially efficient if you use it for cooling at the same time. So if, if you, for example, have a server farm at your company and want to heat the rooms, you can use the heat pump for cooling at the server farm and heating your office spaces at the same time. And this even increases the COP mentioned before further since, since this COP only uh, uses the process heat and not the cooling. Um, but let's uh, put this together in a flow chart. So if you ask yourself the question, does the heat pump fit into my industrial process? You first of all have to ask yourself the question, is the process already optimized? Um, if it is already optimized, the, a heat pump might be unnecessary. Um, next, if, you're, if you, do you have enough waste heat? So to the problem mentioned before, if the waste heat doesn't meet the uh, process heat, then you might have to install um, a thermal energy storage to overcome that, gaps, that gap. But um, if you have enough waste heat, then next on to the next question, are waste heat and demand there at the same, same time? If not, this problem, problem can also be solved with, um, with using an thermal energy storage. Um, do I have too high temperature lifts or is my temperature of the waste heat even higher than the temperature of my process heat? Then I could, for example, use a heat exchange and transfer the heat directly. And to the last point, um, do I need that heat pump a lot of the time? So is it in operation most of the time? And that's what, what I said before, due to the higher initial cost, the heat pump um, pays off faster if it's used often. So if, if you check all these boxes, then yes, uh, a heat pump is a good fit. But if some of them, if you answer some of these questions with no, then there are solutions too. And a heat pump might make sense either way. Um, so since I've got the challenges covered, I want to um, focus again on the advantages. So maybe summarize the advantages. So first of all, um, Heat pumps can, of course, cut costs if implemented correctly. Um, they valorize waste heat, as we've seen on the first slides, where the, that huge demand can be, uh, that huge um, demand comes with the price of a lot of waste heat, and that waste heat can be again valorized by the heat pumps. Um, they increase the energy efficiency of the total system, as we've seen on the slide where the Fossil fuel steam boiler was replaced by a heat pump, and they do reduce CO2 emissions if the 
electricity used is uh, carbon neutral or close to carbon neutral. And th this will be covered by Lucas in the final part of this webinar event. Um, so now I will go on to presenting a demonstrator project that the AIT was involved in. So this is the, the project called Drefficiency. Um, it happened in, so it was the heat pumps in that project were installed in the year 2019. Um, the project was about uh, demonstration of heat pumping technologies in drying processes. So this goes back to the um, second slide of my presentation where I presented the two energy intensive industries. So drying processes are those that um, have a lot of waste heat. And for in this particular project, three industry sectors were involved, which is first of all the food, the food industry, um, the, then the brick industry, and lastly the waste management. And for the brick industry, we have a demonstrator installed at Wienerberger in Uttendorf in Austria. And for the food industry, there's a starch drying process from and where we dry um, starch from the Agrana company, which is located in Austria as well. And for the last part of that project, we <laughs> dried um, sludge. So it's an, a waste drying application. And it's to mention here that um, these first two applications were you were used employing um, traditional heat pumps that just uh, produced hot air. So they dried the bricks and the starch with um, hot air. And the third application was drying the sludge with steam. And for that, we used an MVR system as we have seen in one of the applications of the heat pump configurations. And these are referred to open loop heat pumps since they since fresh steam is always fed in to be recompressed and heated up to use to be used for drying processes. Um, now I want to go to the results of um, the heat pump applications. So first we see um, uh, an overview of the COPs reached by the Wienerberger and Agrana heat pump. And as you can see, they operated over a broad spectrum of temperatures. So we have, um, temperature lifts from below 20 to over 80 degrees Celsius. And also they operated at really high temperatures above um, 160 degrees Celsius. And as you can see that all that these processes um, had higher COPs and to, to go back to the question before. So if you have a lower temperature lift, they achieved higher COPs. And if you have a higher temperature lift, you get lower COPs. And next, I want to um, present um, uh, a figure that shows the resilience of these heat pumps, namely that in the process um, they were implemented in, there were huge variations in the source temperatures, but the heat pump sink site, so the site that um, puts out the process heat was um, barely affected by these um, deviations in the temperature. So what are the, the lessons learned from this project? Um, heat pumps are perfectly suitable for industrial drying processes. Um, up until now, they can reach temperatures of up to 160 degrees Celsius, or at least in that project, they were um, able to reach temperatures of up to 160 degrees Celsius. Um, both the air and steam drying applications um, were working perfectly and they were very good at handling varying waste heat temperatures. Um, within this project, uh, within this project, new technologies were de developed, which um, was one of the key requirements of the project to to make technology technological inventions possible. And um, what's to mention here is that the heat pumps used didn't directly interfere in the drying process. So the drying process could be optimized and even higher efficiencies could be reached. Um, I think this is where my, my project partner will continue with the, the next um, industrial demonstrator project. And this will be shown in the 
next so in the part industrial demonstrate this um he will also give you an overview of the market outlook so what um, heat pumps are com commercially available on the market right now and lastly my colleague lucas will tell you something about the environmental perspective of, of heat pumps so the life cycle emissions of heat pumps um, in general. So that was it from my part, and I think it's time for Clément, please take over. Okay, thanks, uh, Felix. Uh, um, maybe, uh, I, I don't know if you already answered to this, uh, someone asked uh, the example of 60 to 140 degrees, is the gas 100% 100% saturated with moisture. I think it depends on the process. So at some processes it might, at some processes it might not, but still if you come, if you burn gas, you will get some moisture content in your uh, output steam. Okay, so um, we are receiving a lot of questions, so, so uh, we probably won't have enough time to answer them all. Uh, we invite you to reach to the key speakers after the webinar. Uh, you will find uh, the key speakers uh, email on the presentation, which will be available online in the Bamboo Project website uh, in the resources, uh, resources section. Okay. So now let's pass to the next uh, next panel, next uh, presentation. Clement Gachot from uh, EDF will give us a market uh, uh, overview. Please, uh, Clement. Yes. You see my presentation? Yeah, yes, we see it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello everyone. So, I'm really uh, happy to 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 assist to this webinar and to uh, uh, participate with my my colleagues. Thank you very much uh, for Icons for the organization and CSA uh, for the organization of this webinar. It's a good opportunity to speak about uh, uh, really efficient uh, solutions. Uh, just to add, uh, what's uh, Felix said about uh, EDF. Uh, one of our priorities is to help our customers to uh, decarbonize uh, their, their defense cop um, in industry. And that's one, uh, one of our big goals. Um, and heat pumps is uh, uh, one of the solutions for that. So that's uh, why we are really interested on working on in this area. Um, the presentation I'm going to uh, show you is uh, divided in two parts. The first one is the market overview of steam generating heat pumps with three parts. Uh, the focus on the French market, a um, uh, small focus on the uh, European market, and the main stakeholders and tier levels of their technologies. Uh, the second part will be um, more focused on the bamboo project and the heat pump demo uh, with uh, information about the context and the architecture of the heat pumps. Uh, and uh, the test facilities and test bench and the first results and next steps. So for the first part, begin with the um, a quick overview of the of the French market for heat pumps. Um, we have identified uh, around 31 terawatt hour uh, of uh, um, potential technical potential in France for heat pumps, which is uh, quite huge. It could represent more than 5,000 heat pumps in uh, in all our industries. As you can see on the slide, uh, the the heat pump market is divided in in, in three parts for uh, our point of view, which is uh, heat pumps providing heat uh, up to 70 degrees, which is standard heat pump, high temperature heat pumps, uh, which provide heat to from uh, 70 to 100 degrees. Uh, as you can see, it could represent the third of the market, and uh, very high temperature heat pumps, which could provide one uh, heat to 100 and 150 uh, and this uh, last part which represent the, the most important uh, market uh, is mainly uh, using steam as heat carrier and that's why uh, steam generating heat pumps are really important 
um, in order to, to, to show the importance of uh, heat pumps for decarbonization, uh, this market could uh, lower than more than 8 million tons of CO2 per year, uh, which represents 15% of the emission of thermal use in uh, uh, industry in France. And with this um, uh, 31 tower, tower of heat pumps, it could, represent, uh, it could permit to uh, recover uh, more than 20% of the waste heat in France. Um, this uh, um, 31 tower tower is uh, uh, for 65 percent um, uh, for uh, food industry, food, paper, and chemical industry. Um, just to to show on at the uh, European level, uh, um, uh, Felix just had uh, give some uh, percentage on this. Uh, on this side, uh, but just to show you, uh, uh, since the heat pumps could uh, reach, uh, uh, for the moment, we could say 160 degrees and uh, maybe in the next years 200 degrees, uh, the market potential uh, of process heat could be uh, 700 tower tower, which is the uh, total heat demand. So it's not really a, a market potential, but that show uh, what uh, uh, heat demand uh, the heat pumps could reach in Europe. Um, so on the stakeholders uh, on steam generating heat pumps, uh, um, there is um, a lot of, uh, it's a, a, a really moving uh, market right now, so uh, uh, main, mainly uh, in, in, in Europe. So there is um, a different uh, tier level solution, so the colors of the square uh, on the, the graph is uh, um, linked to the TL level. So the higher TL is, uh, uh, so TL9 is uh, commercially available technologies, uh, and uh, TL4 is uh, uh, as a um, simulation uh, 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 stage. Uh, so um, you will see uh, uh, there is a various uh, TL level solutions. Um, already available uh, on, the, on the market with many stakeholders. These data are coming from um, mostly from the Annex 58 of the AAA, which is dedicated to high temperature heat pumps. Uh, and uh, there is a, a specific analysis on, done on the TRL of steam generating heat pumps because uh, sometimes the uh, data on TRL for, from um, uh, this Annex is um, not focused only on steam generating heat pumps. Um, so uh, not all the data are confirmed, but uh, uh, that uh, show how many manufacturers are working on in this area. Uh, so as you can see on my slide, the first two is a uh, uh, TR level of eight uh, is uh, Olvondo and Omia industry. And uh, uh, also there is uh, uh, SPH, which is working uh, uh, in this area and uh, making, their, making their first uh, demonstrator right now. Uh, and you can see on the, uh, the left side is the, the temperature level they could reach, and the, uh, on the right side the uh, power of the um, the power of the heat pump they can provide. Uh, also in the uh, TRL6 there is Enerin, and after at a lower TRL there is a lot of manufacturers, uh, which are Maikawa and at time Siemens Energy at Chobunin, which is work, are working right now on, on steam generating heat pumps, and uh, they are uh, looking for demonstrator for that technology. Uh, as you can see on the slide, there is uh, um, heat pump manufacturers and also ORC manufacturers, which are uh, using that technology to, uh, to, to, to make heat pumps. Um, also, uh, on the slides, you can see other manufacturers on the right, which are uh, um, working in other uh, parts of the world. Uh, uh, in US, there is Atmos Zero and CTS, and in Japan, there is Kobelco, which is quite known on this area because they were one of the first to work on steam generating heat pumps, uh, but they are not available in Europe. So on the second part of uh, this presentation, I'm going to uh, speak about uh, more on the Bamboo project and the heat pump demo. Uh, so first of all, the context. So uh, uh, as it was introduced by CSA, uh, there is a three pillar on the Bamboo project. And the uh, ones we, we will focus on is, is the third one, which is the waste heat recovery. Um, for the heat pumps demo, there we are three partners to work on this demo, which is AIT, uh, represented by uh, Felix today, EDF and ArcelorMittal, uh, uh, which represent uh, for us the, the customers and the use case we have studied. 
So the use case uh, where the demo was um, uh, studied is um, a use case of pickling line from ArcelorMittal, uh, which uh, uh, give uh, uh, waste heat stream at 80 degrees, uh, and they need uh, steam inside the, the, the process at 152 degrees to heat an acid bath uh, necessary to the to the pickling line. So as you can see on the uh, right uh, uh, on, on the um, on the side of the uh, the slide, uh, the integration of the heat pumps. Uh, so uh, there is a condensate tank that we are uh, using as a source at the evaporator of the heat pump, and after we are uh, producing uh, pressurized hot water at the condenser of the heat pumps and uh, putting the, uh, the the pressurized hot water in the flash tank and then generate steam and put the steam uh, in an exchanger to heat the acid bath. Um, there is two ways to, 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 pr to produce um, uh, steam with uh, heat pumps. Uh, the, the, they were presented by Felix just before. So the, the first one is to produce directly in the um, condenser of the heat pump. So there is uh, the condensation and the evaporation of the water. Uh, and uh, the other one is uh, to produce uh, pressurized hot water at the output of the condenser and then put this uh, uh, pressurized hot water in the flash tank to generate steam. Uh, we have chosen to uh, uh, work on the uh, second one, uh, which is the flash tank, uh, ma mainly because uh, it's uh, uh, one of the uh, best solutions to produce steam, but uh, uh, also uh, as EDF is not a um, heat pump manufacturer, uh, uh, this permits to use um, uh, all kind of water to water heat pumps, which is using water as a source and uh, heating water um, as a heat needs, and uh, uh, that can uh, make possible to, uh, uh, to, to put in uh, uh, every industry uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, heat pump uh, solutions, uh, the, the, the steam generating solution. Um, to do the test of uh, the, the first test of the uh, bamboo uh, heat pump demo, we have used uh, test facilities from EDF, uh, which is located near to Paris uh, in EDF Lab Les Renardières. Uh, these labs uh, can um, uh, test uh, up to one megawatt heat pumps uh, with uh, uh, more than 145 degrees uh, uh, temperature uh, at the condenser. So. Uh, uh, this uh, permit to um, uh, test uh, uh, the uh, different uh, performance of uh, to assess the different the, the performance of uh, heat pumps uh, to make sure uh, the uh, performance is here and uh, uh, to go after on the uh, process of uh, of the customers. So we use this um, uh, this facility in another way. As you can uh, uh, see on uh, on the next slide, um, uh, we are using. Uh, so um, I'm just coming back. Uh, on the, the in the lab, there is the um, the, the the cool the cool side of uh, uh, the lab, which is uh, going to the evaporator of the uh, heat pumps, and there is the uh, hot uh, source of the lab, which is going to the condenser of the uh, of the heat pump. Uh, and but for the the steam generating heat pump, we are directly using the hot side uh, of the the hot side loop of the of the lab directly to the evaporator because uh, we are using uh, directly water uh, uh, to the condenser to generate steam and, and, uh, uh, and that's all. Um, so um, the heat pump characteristic uh, used for the uh, prototype uh, is a, a heat booster and it's the, the thermal power of the heat pump is to 150 kilowatts. Uh, the temperature uh, at the condenser uh, up to 165 degrees. The working fluid is a HFO with low GW, which is M1366 uh, MZZ, and the compressor type is piston. Um, so we are using this, uh, um, uh, this heat pump, uh, and we are coupling it with a, um, a flash tank. So um, we are uh, uh, generating heat up to uh, 80 to 100 degrees at the evaporator, and after we are putting water uh, inside the, uh, the input of the condenser, 
the pressurized hot water goes out of the condenser and goes to uh, the flash tank to generate steam. For now, the steam uh, for the tests uh, are going uh, out, but we hope that in the uh, next month we will uh, uh, go on the uh, on, on, on site to, uh, to do the demonstration with a, a process at the end. So for the, f the, the, the first results, uh, so the test uh, was ended uh, uh, in November, so it quite, uh, it's a really uh, uh, early, early uh, result that uh, I'm showing uh, to, to you now. Um, so the, there is um, uh, three different uh, temperature uh, at the heating uh, of the heat pumps uh, we are showing you. So the first test was at 120 degrees this, uh, and up to uh, a COP of 3.5, as you can see on the, on the graph. Uh, we have done all, uh, um, tests at 140 degrees too, with a COP of 2.5 uh, for the uh, COP of the heat pump, uh, and um, uh, test at 152 degrees, which uh, uh, close to uh, five bar uh, steam, uh, and uh, with a COP of around two. So as you can see on this graph, there is some, the gray uh, circle are, are for the COP of the system, so the heat pumps and the flash tank, and the orange one are uh, only for the heat pumps. Uh, and uh, uh, we are quite uh, happy to see to 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 tell you that uh, it's uh, working uh, very well, and uh, uh, we hope to continue to to work on the, uh, this demonstration uh, in the next months. So uh, for the next steps, uh, so the test are at EDF facilities are ended, uh, and now uh, we will uh, bring uh, the uh, heat pumps uh, demo to uh, ArcelorMittal facilities, uh, uh, and they will uh, start test uh, in, in December of this year. Uh, until the end of the project of the bamboo project, uh, which is uh, at the uh, end of uh, February of 2023. Uh, on our side, we will uh, continue to work on this uh, uh, prototype to optimize uh, the energy performance of uh, the uh, combination of a very high temperature heat pump and flash tank. And we will work uh, to uh, couple this with MVR, which was, was introduced uh, by Felix earlier, uh, in order to open the heat pump market to higher temperature. Uh, and uh, we will work to uh, uh, integrate other uh, very high temperature heat pumps available on the market. Uh, at a megawatt scale uh, in the laboratory uh, to uh, test uh, steam generating at different use cases on different use cases uh, of industries. Uh, and we will uh, work at a, a, a demonstrator uh, at a customer's facility uh, in 2023 and 2024. And uh, we uh, are working on integrating the steam generating heat pumps uh, in the solution of our decarbonization offers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clément, for your presentation. The next panelist is Lucas Zeiler Bauer, research associate at the Energy Institute of the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, and is going to talk to us about life cycle assessment of on high temperature heat pumps. Uh, as I said in my introduction, at the end of this presentation, we will have a last uh, session of polls. Please, Lucas, you have the floor. Yep, thank you for the introduction. So, as my colleagues already mentioned, we're going to talk about the last part of the session, which will be on the life cycle assessment on high temperature heat pumps, um, those systems as we've just seen before. So, um, okay, there we go. Um, just to uh, give you a brief introduction on LCA, I mean, it's the same thing basically for, I don't know, pretty much every consumer good, right? We, we, we as customers want to buy a uh, sustainable product, right? So it doesn't matter if it's a new car or new technology or even clothing, right? So we want product A to be more sustainable than product B. So this is what we will buy then, I guess. So if we want to assess this, of course, we would have like to have a clear result, right? We want to see that product A is better than B, but not as good as product C, for example. So, however, <clears throat> um, sorry, I didn't mean to change. 
However, such answers are not easily done in LCA and it mostly boils down to answers which uh, start with the phrase, it depends, which is a bit unsatisfying, but yeah, this is just the way we have to, <clears throat> we have to deal with those results, I guess. I mean, uh, since LCA is quite a young method, um, there has been some considerable efforts by various research groups to normalize this, those sustainability studies so we can compare them between each other. So in the end, we did find this ISO 14044, which states how to conduct the uh, standardized life cycle assessment. And it always consists of the same four phases, which is also the same in the study done on our high temperature heat pumps. Normally, the first one is the definition of goal and scope, right? We want to state, uh, let's say, what is our mission statement? What is our subject and what are we looking at? And for this case, we had a cradle to gate LCA of one gigajoule of thermal energy produced by a high temperature heat pump with a lifetime of 15 years in Europe. This is uh, quite long, but um, for reasons of comparability, you have to state all of those things. Um, just real quick, cradle to gate does mean we start at the raw material extraction, the transport, the, the transforming and all the things. Uh, really sorry, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, of all the things we need to produce this heat pump, then we transport this heat pump and then we have it operating for 15 years, right? So also all the electricity we're gonna use in those 15 years will be accounted for. Then the next step is the inventory analysis, which is basically in, let's say, improved mass balance. So we want to know what goes in and out and where does it go? And in the last step, in the impact assessment, we somehow, we somehow have to translate those things, right? If we know, I don't know, we need, for example, 10 kilowatt hours, then we need to assess, okay, this, those 10 kilowatt hours, what are their environmental impacts, right? What's the global warming potential? What's the toxicity levels? And this is done via standardized methods. And in this case, CML will be used if you're familiar with some of them. Okay, so determine, to determine those impacts um, of this one gigajoule of steam, we needed significant amount of data, right? And now I'm gonna talk about how we did obtain this data. I mean, first and foremost, we need to build the pump, right? So we have to have a material balance. And in the end, I mean, there are actual systems available, not that many as of now, but there are. But as you can imagine, the manufacturers are not too keen on displaying their whole material balance. So we really had to mix and match those values. We had some, we did find data on actual systems, but others we had to scale from literature. And yeah, this is basically what we did. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> okay, then the next um, process step we investigated on its own is the working fluid data. So of course we also have to produce this working this working fluid. We also assumed some leakage and some end of life treatment. There we also had some modeling and literature data, and we did have some experts estimate on how to best to assess them. And of course for the power output and the efficiency or the COP, as Felix uh, already explained, we were able to use real data from the manufacturers. So just real quick, once we got all this data, we entered them into our LCA software. This is Gabby, if you're familiar. I know this is a bit bad, so I'm gonna zoom in. So for example, this is the heat pump production, this process step. So we do have copper, PVC, we have reinforcing steel. So all of this stuff goes in it, right? Then we also have, um, you know, in the standard bed process we use, there's also some plastic byproduct we have to, we have to incinerate this plastic, then we get uh, steam and power, which we substitute to grid. So basically what I'm uh, trying to show here is that we did assess, we try to assess the system as a whole to not to include anything and to really give a fair balance of the system. Which already brings us to <clears throat> some of the hard facts we obtained. And on the left-hand side, you can see the system boundary for our LCA. So as I've said before, we do have the heat pump production, we do have power generation, thermal energy, of course, raw materials going into the production of the heat pump. For the working fluid, we have the chemical production, right? And for the use phase, I mean, the use phase is basically just the electricity we need. So it's just power generation. And some facts on the system. We have, we assume 15 years of lifetime for the machinery, 8,000 hours a year operation time. The output is roughly 0.7 megawatts for the electricity inputs. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> I don't know, I think my mouse has some issues. For the grid mix, we did use the EU28. So we'd assume that the electricity used for this heat pump and the results you're gonna see in a minute is the, the one from the, the mean one from the EU, 
We're also going to have some thermal energy for the construction of the heat pump, which we assumed comes from CNG, so from natural gas. We did include construction, yet the end of life is not included simply because data was not available. So end of life would be, I guess, recycling since most of the materials could be reused since it's mostly metal, I guess. And the working fluids are modeled with a proxy, which is R130A, which is 112 tetrafluoroethane. This is due to the simple reason that this was the only set that had a day, only chemical that had a data set available, right? Because all of the other ones, they, they do intend, they do employ some really special chemicals which are not um, manufactured in big amounts. So we just had to use a proxy there. And the COP is 2.5. So Celine, if we can cue the first poll, please. We also have two more questions in terms of those things for you guys. So, um, so I'm sorry, I can't see the poll right now. Yes, the poll is which, which one of the three steps do you think is the most important in terms of climate change mitigation, building the machine, working fluid production and machinery use phase and or all are equally important. Yeah, thank you for reading that. <laughs> So the results are as follows, 42% uh, uh, have answered all are equally important, 31% use phase, 22% work in fluid production and machinery, and 5% 5 5 building the machine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so then we're going to solve this poll we just heard. So in here. So these are our impacts. On the right side, you see the abbreviations and what they mean, so the damage category. And on the left-hand side, we have normalized impacts. So this doesn't give uh, results for this in, in absolute numbers. Those are relative numbers. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the global warming potential in these yellow bars, which is almost exclusively defined by the electricity use, so by the use phase. I mean, this might sound a bit surprising since we have this big machine with concrete and metal and so on. Um, also, we have those working fluids. Some of them have some really high GBPs of, I don't know, I think a thousand kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram working fluid, which we also did see in the chat before. But you have to think about it this way, right? So we're going to operate this machine for 15 years. So this is 15 years worth of electricity. And we know that electricity has quite a big impact. So this is how this results comes together. I mean, for the other uh, <clears throat> categories, I'm not going to get it too much into detail here due to the limited time. But those thing, those categories ending with TP, which is toxicity potential, see those are mainly connected to production, right? So the machinery and so on. But for all of the others, like the global warming potential or also the eutrophication, okay, now it's, sorry. The eutrophication is mainly dominated by the electricity used. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, so we're going to skip the last poll as you already saw the slide. Okay, so I was going to ask, um, what do you think is the, is the highest percentage one can actually save by employing one of those high temperature heat pumps? And in this example, we did use a French grid because it's one of the lowest in carbon intensity in all of Europe. And we did compare it with some benchmarks, right? We did have biogas, biomass, light fuel oil or diesel and natural gas. So those, those spheres are the global warming potential per gigajoule steam. And for a heat pump, we are able to reach 2.87 kilograms CO2 equivalent, which is really quite good. Uh, on comparison for light fuel oil, so we do have 89.4 kilograms, right? So in this case, a reduction of uh, up to 97% is possible, which is really a tremendous amount. Um, yeah. But we do see that or even for all the other categories, the high temperature heat pump yielded preferable results. So basically, as soon as the, <clears throat> let's just say that uh, anything fossil you're replacing with steam produced by high temperature heat pump, you're saving global warming. You're reducing your global warming potential, you're cutting carbon emissions. And I think this is a really uh, good note to end on, but of course we have to, we have to point out that this is no real life implementations 
So the results may differ in real use cases. So, okay, then. thank you guys. Thanks a lot, Lucas. These are quite impressive numbers. Um, so, uh, as I said, we have a few questions for our panelists. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, to retrieve them. Uh, there are some very uh, uh, technical questions. Uh, okay, uh, what kind of heat pump are you working in this project? Ammonia-based hybrid. Uh, I don't know if this has been already answered. I don't remember. Ammonia-based hybrid heat pump. It's it's an ACE for uh, working fluid uh, in the heat pump. It's the M thirteen thirty six M. That's it. Normally, what are the factors? Uh, what factors will be considered in selecting the heat pump fluid? Yeah, I think uh, I'll try to answer these questions. Um, uh, I tried to show this in this, this one diagram where um, I showed the critical temperatures of the different refrigerants. And it may, mainly comes down to the critical temperature, the latent heat content, in order to um, transfer a lot of heat at the heat exchanger and what has been becoming more um, important recently is the environmental impact of these refrigerants. So there's this, um, I think right now I can't remember the English name, but I guess it's F gas um, constitution or something like that, um, which tells you that uh, refrigerants with really high GWP values, so with uh, very high global warming potentials are to be phased out. I think th those are the main things you have to take to, into account if you choose your refrigerant. Uh, another question about uh, the refrigerant. In the refrigerant list, I did not see R1233ZD, which has a high critical temperature. Did you consider it? Um, yeah, of course, uh, I've, I've heard of that refrigerant, and um, in many modern modern heat pumps that reach high temperatures, it is used. Um, and I think I, I only included one HFO in that uh, overview, and that was the R1336MZZZ, and I think it has a similar critical temperature to the one that you just said. Okay, a question related to possible additional uh, heat pump challenges. How about avail availability of working fluids, possible leakages, the costs, and GWP values of some refrigerant utilized? I don't know who to this question is addressed, <laughs> but I, I try to answer it. I think um, all three of us are concerned with these topics. Um, Maybe I'll just um, start with GWP. So um, HFOs generally have low GWPs, and the phased out um, refrigerants have higher GWPs. And then there are the natural refrigerants, which include ammonia, water, or carbon dioxide, which have COPs close to zero or one for carbon dioxide. Um, I think I don't recall the rest of the question. Can you please repeat it for me? Sorry, I, I was going to the following question. So, uh, okay, HP challenges. How about availability of working fluids? Possible leakages? Costs and GWP values of some refrigerant. Um, yeah, availability. I don't know too much about. Maybe Clemor can later answer that question. Um, oh. And leakages. Um, this mainly goes in Lucas's um, LCA analysis, and 
I think for industrial sized heat pumps, they are below 1% of the filling amount in a year. So I don't know, after 20 years of um, heat pump operation, you still have 80% of your heat pump fluid inside your heat pump. And maybe Clemor, can you say something about the availability and prices? Yeah. Uh, uh, body, just to, to, to go back to the leakage, uh, um, using GWP, uh, using a f a working fluid with really low GWP, um, um, as Lucas said, is 1% uh, of leakage per year contained in this LCA analysis. I think it's one. Uh, and uh, the, the, the decarbonization done with the uh, heat pumps is uh, really. Uh, higher than the leakage impact of the working fluid so that's not the the the, the, the big problem um uh, using low GWP working fluid uh, and for the um, availability um uh, i think that this is not uh, the big challenge for heat pumps for now the big challenge is to uh, making demonstration on uh, process uh, different process in industry uh, and and the, 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 yes, the, the main challenge is more here, uh, but uh, to reach uh, the um, carbon neutral uh, target that we all have, uh, uh, maybe in the uh, long term future, it could be a, a, a problem to manage, but for now, this is, this is not a big issue. There is a lot of solutions, different solutions with natural and HFO. Okay, so I next. I hope that's answer to your question. <laughs> next question: uh, Is there not a heat recovery source derived from the compressor? It's about the basic heat pump schematic. Uh, I Nobody? think I don't understand the question. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. I don't know how to answer it. Yeah. Sorry. If the person who sent this uh, question can precise it and send it again. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, please get back to me and I'll try to answer it in more detail. Uh, what are the specifics of the capacity temperatures and, comp and components? Apparently, it was a question that was asked uh, while Clement was uh, speaking. Um, can, can you just repeat the question? I'm sorry. What are the specifics of the capacity temperature and components? Um, so uh, uh, for the for the, the the component that we are using, we could reach uh, temperature up to so the, the the heat pumps could provide heat up to 165 degrees. Um, and uh, for the test, uh, I think we. Uh, I mean, go higher than 150 degrees for, for the this, this steam generation generator. So for the moment, that's the limit. Uh, and uh, we will uh, work on uh, uh, going higher than this limit in the future. But for now, that's the limit. Uh, after this is uh, um, uh, in, 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 in the future of the work. So I don't know if Felix, you want to add something? Or? No, I think you answered that question quite good. Let me see if there are more questions. No, I think uh, that's all. Anyway, it's uh, 4.29, so I think uh, I can uh, thank all the participants and panelists for being with us and close uh, our webinar. Uh, if you have uh, more questions, as I said uh, earlier, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the key speakers uh, through the emails uh, uh, which are which should be available online in the Bamboo Project website. Um, so um, I hope you enjoyed it and I thank uh, all the participants and panelists for being with us. I remind you that the next and last webinar of the series will take place next Wednesday, November the 30th same time, 3 p.m. Central European time. And we will talk about virtual battery model applied to a use case from the pulp and paper sector. I hope to see you there. 
So now have a great afternoon and uh, see you soon. Bye. Hi, thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank, you. thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you to all participants.